what's checking, everybody? Welcome to another Overreaction Monday show here on Orange Bloods Live. I'm Jeff Ketchum, joined by Anwar Richardson and Alex Dunlap. Do us a solid. Hit that thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel. Get notifications. Just bang, bang, bang. Get it all done. And then we won't annoy you the rest of the day while we ask for you to do those things. Uh, thanks to everybody jumping into the Specs chat. We do appreciate your comments, your super chats. We really appreciate your super chats. Should you want to dive in, know that the super chat shoots you straight to the front of the line. You get to skip over everybody. That's how we do it here on Orange Was Live. So, guys, a final week of practice before Saturday's spring game, the spring workouts for the Texas Longhorns. Um, you know, we're coming towards the end of the line before the second phase of the off season kids will be finishing up their schoolwork finals. Then we hit the summer. We return back in August and it's football season. Although on war might add that sec meetings, the sec media days, all of the things that are quickly approaching will help fill those gaps. Uh, one of the things that we'll be talking about today, we're going to be centering a lot of the discussion around top 10 players in the program right now. The top 10, we're making a list, so to speak. We'll be talking about all of the positions, all of the players uh, into the discussion. And oh, by the way, this team had another scrimmage on Saturday. You can read all the details over at orangebloods.com. Anwar, good morning. Uh, before we jump into list making and talking about players that belong in top 10 conversations, your thoughts on the team coming out of the weekend scrimmage? Um, you know, well, you know, obviously it was it was good to, you know, hear things about the defense, obviously, uh performing well. I, you know, and 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 having some moments. Obviously, you know, Jonte Cook caught a, a touchdown uh, pass as well. So, you know, those things were good. The, 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 the probably wasn't a huge, overwhelming thought, I think, for me, Catch, only because I think, it, you know, one of the things you, I, I don't know if you had outlined it in, in your column or something like that, but, you know, on no matter what scrimmage, you're always going to have winners and losers, right? And so you're like, oh, man, offense looks good. Defense sucks. And then, like, defense looks good. Offense sucks. So I didn't have too many uh, overwhelming thoughts, but it was what the good thing I, I feel like catches names that we've been wanting to hear, like the Sorrells, like Cook, like the na names we've been wanting to hear. We're starting to hear as we, you know, getting towards the end of spring. Um, and so for me, that's, a, you know, was obviously overall a good thing. And of course, you know, hearing Jaden Blue's name but once again, um, you know, all of us have resonated. Alex, same question. I know that you were out of town, busy. You weren't quite on it the way you would be on a weekend when you're, you know, on it. Um, any any major thoughts before we jump into this exercise of putting together a top 10 Texas football players list as we get ready to end, you know, meet the end of the spring? Well, it's like um, it's like our great poster on the site, E. Cheese, man. I always give him credit for saying this about how spring football is – it's it's always a zero sum game, right? The, the scrimmages, the spring game, all the rest of it. You know, if, if somebody looks really awesome and one wide receiver dominates, you're like, well, why is this corner so bad? We, you know, um, so I can understand, you know, on Moore's hesitance to really say he takes much much away from it. I'll just say that I think it's cool that this last scrimmage we've heard about how the how good the defense look. We've heard about. Um, you know, through different practices, maybe the defense starts out well, but the offense comes on towards the end of practice, like we heard about this one. And it feels like it's been, you know, really varying for three scrimmages, sort of um, whether it's the offense or whether it's the defense, you know, it's the, the, the first scrimmage, a lot of big offensive plays and stuff like that. The second scrimmage was one where the offense felt like it couldn't quite get it going in the same way, had trouble sustaining drives, but did better in some of those red zone drills. That's another thing, red zone drills. Like they've had actually had good red zone drills this last scrimmage too. Yep. So I, I guess I didn't think about that till, till now as I was talking about it. But I guess that's a kind of a takeaway. That's something that obviously fans had. A, um, I would I would I, I would imagine Savion Red isn't in there at quarterback in too many of those situations <laughs> during practice. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, man. Uh, I just I, I I think it's cool that we've seen different parts of the team sort of pop up as being the main positive points right through the course of 
um, through the course of spring because that probably shows that there's good balance. Yeah, it's an interesting point. Uh, last two scrimmages, offense has done its best work in the red zone, but it hasn't been able to really sustain long drives that the meat of the scrimmage for the last two scrimmages has mostly been controlled by the defense, but the offense, you know, depending on how you look at it, winning in the red zone, that's one of the most important things that'll happen for a team during the season. Doesn't do you any good to move the ball between the twenties up and down and then not be able to sustain it in the red zone. So you're right. Zero sum game positives. Come on defense, work on your red zone packages. (laughs) Um, but overall, yeah, I think uh, I think Alex, you're you're right in that it doesn't feel like any one person or phase of the game has dominated these scrimmage situations. There's been some balance between them. They've taken turns. We'll be interested to see what it looks like in the spring game on Saturday. Okay, let's do this. So, for those that don't know, before the spring, back in fe- early February. I did my top 25, right, my list of the top 25 Longhorns in the program players um, going into the spring. And then as an exercise, I thought yesterday, plus I was just looking for something new to write about. I thought, why don't I take a look at my top 25 list, specifically the top 10 list, see how much I think things have changed. There were a few things that I thought absolutely changed. Players that I thought, oh, my God, that guy's got to be in the top five. I didn't even have him in the top ten going into the spring. And then that kind of leads us to the journey that we're going to be on in this conversation is each of us come up, coming up with our own top ten list. Uh, it's easier for me. I did it last night, so I can lean on that unless some of the conversation here uh, changes my thought process and maybe I'll tweak my list a little bit. Guys, let's start here. Quarterback position. Quinn Ewers is an obvious one, right? I don't feel like we need to spend a lot of time talking about his worthiness in a top 10 list. He's in it. Where each of us slot him inside the top five or the top 10 is where we slot him. But I feel like we would all agree he's worthy. Does Arch Manning get any thought consideration at all for being one of the top 10 players in the program at this exact moment? Well, when when I got a text, you know, 30 minutes ago that this was going to be the topic, and I started putting together a list. I mean, I didn't. I certainly. I mean, you start putting together a list. There's there's no room to put in Arch Manning once you go through the once you go through the process of this, and you actually start putting pen to paper and writing down names. You just. I know everybody would like to say, you know, yeah. why did you put not put this guy on your list or not this guy? It's like, well, it's, it's only ten spots. Like it's it's <laughs> it's it's hard to it's it's hard to get Arch Manning on there. And I I think with Quinn, the it wasn't about whether he was going to be top ten, top five. It's like is he is, is he number one, right? Like, do I need to make him number one be, because he's the quarterback and because, um, man, Quinn Ewers just looked better than I've ever seen him this year. You know, it's like Amor and I have had this before. I was a buyer sell question I had for Amor. Is this the best you've ever seen Quinn Ewers look? Amor's like, well, yeah. You know, it's like it's pretty obvious when you're out there and, and you see him. I mean, Quinn, Quinn, Quinn is dealing this this spring, and I feel like it doesn't get talked about as much because you know it, it's it's kind of been expected. You know, it's like the same way that we don't talk about Anthony Hill as much or Kelvin Banks or some of these other guys, right? It's like it's kind of expected. These guys, you know, Ant, Ant, Anthony Hill's awesome. Kelvin Banks is awesome. Quinn, this year, man, for, look, Quinn versus Air, throwing to throwing to Xavier Worthy and throwing to A.D. Mitchell and J.T. Sanders and Jordan Whittington at a, at a pro day, he's always going to look awesome. He looks awesome in these in these kinds of setups, right? So, um, yeah, for for Quinn, I've I've never seen Quinn sl- slinging the football like this, and so for me, it's e- you know for me it's easy to make him you know the very top of the list as far as where he slotted. I guess we'll we'll get into that later. That, that the, yeah, as it relates to, to, to the arch question, uh, catch nah, nah, you know, but but I, I will make I will make a prediction though today on a Monday is Arch will throw a touchdown pass on Saturday, and that will be what the world talks about, and we'll be bombarded with is he gonna battle Quinn for the starting position? You're gonna go on a radio show and someone's gonna ask you, hey, is Arch pushing? Like I'm gonna go on shows next week and someone's gonna ask me the same thing. So and, and so I will make that prediction 
that he'll do something good in the spring game. And the people outside who don't know will talk about it. But for right now, no, he's not in that top 10 conversation. He's going to have the Malik Murphy 2023 spring game performance. Yes. But, it, but, but, but magnified because of his name, right? Just get, you remember like last year uh, catch, uh, that's, that was one of the leads. I think on ESPN and sports said was like Arch completed a pass in the spring game. They didn't even mention Malik or Quinn. It's just what Arch did. So if he'll, he's a, he's a backup quarterback. He will throw a touchdown pass in the spring game. And that will be what's on Sports Center on on the, on Saturday night and Sunday morning, but we'll we'll know better. Yeah, I uh, I will say I at least considered Arch a little bit. He's had a good Ooh. spring. I've had a lot of people mention to me that they think there will be a seamless transition when Quinn and Arch eventually turn over. I think he's closer to that kind of conversation, but I'd be disingenuous if I said as I finished my top 10 and there was a group of guys fighting for the last couple of spots. He wasn't quite in that, but if you ask me top 20, I'd say, yeah, no, I'd, I'd put the former number one player in the 2023 recruiting class uh, and a guy that's made a lot of uh, progress. Uh, when people say, no, I don't think there'd be a big change at the quarterback position. If Quinn gets hurt and Arch comes in, I think things will be okay. Well, if you think that Quinn's, somewhere near the top two, three, one, whatever, wherever you have him on your list. And those types of comments are being made. Then Arch to me probably deserves to be somewhere in that discussion. Although I think we're all on the same page. What about running backs? If we're, there's been so many different names mentioned in the running back conversation this spring, it was Christian Clark. We've heard some, even a little Jarek Wisner, or excuse me, Jarek Gibson. And then Trey Wisner has been getting a lot of conversation, uh, certainly in the second half of camp. Obviously, Jaden Blue is a guy that's been getting constant conversation. What running backs warrant being talked about in this type of conversation? Anwar, I'll go with you first. Well, you know, we did overreaction Monday just a couple of weeks ago, and I was like, my overreaction was Jaden Blue's RB1. And I had, no, there's been, look, we know on paper, obviously he's not, right? And, and we know C.J. Baxter is the starting running back. We know C.J. Baxter will probably be the guy that, you know, runs out the tunnel and takes the first snap, uh, you know, in the season opener. But as far as the buzz around camp, um, you know, Jaden Blue, is, he's had that consistent buzz uh, throughout this entire offseason it hasn't changed it's never faltered from every scrimmage from just about every practice like you hear that name constantly and so um and look to the point that you know Steve Sarkeesian made Jaden Blue available to the media last week and the previous week you know he he made CJ Baxter available but we are starting hearing, you know a lot more blue buzz and I thought okay he just did that just to squash the whole Jaden Blue conversation. CJ Baxter, that's my number one guy. It's that indirect way of saying it. And then all of a sudden, Jaden Blue shows up on Thursday, and I go, oh, well, I, hello. This this means something. And, you know, the last time we had RB1 and RB2 talking was Bijan and Roshan. So, um, you know, this it's, it's not a little thing to me where not only are we hearing things, but then – He's doing everything behind the scenes. When they make you available to the media, they're saying they're co-signing on you as a player and as a leader behind the scenes. So Jaden Blue, uh, for sure, is a is, is a conversation starter for me. Alex, I have trouble. I mean, it's I, I think Jaden Blue's been the running back that's helped himself the most through camp. But who knows, man? Maybe Trey Wisner has too. <laughs> He comes in as an afterthought, and now we kind of, you know, it's like he's been sort of forced into the conversation by all the, um, all of the unsolicited comments from Steve Sarkeesian and then also guys on the actual football team, right? Um, were, weren't you saying last week that Blue was talking to you about how, how much better Wisner's gotten? Yeah. Uh -huh. so, it's like you keep on hearing his name from all the weirdest pockets of the program. Um, but still, I, I think when you're talking about, the attempt to make an ascension to RB1 and the fact that, look, if we look, it's like, I, I know you from season to season, teams are different and things are different and cultures are different. And I, even within the same program, I, I get it. 
but it's really hard to overlook just the consistency with which Sarkeesian's gotten these guys to be 1,000-yard rushers, and there's usually that dude, right? And so, I mean, it feels like there's probably a little bit of a motivation to ascend to kind of becoming that dude in the, in the system. And Jaden Blue has certainly been the one that feels like he's – feels like he's really stepped up and kind of answered that call to, you know, go really above him. And this is not to say that C.J. Baxter has looked bad from anything we've heard or from anything we've seen. He's looked fine. He's looked like C.J. Baxter. I think Jaden Blues looked like a different level of player than we saw last season. Whenever we were talking about Jaden Blue, it's like, well, gosh, he, he really is dynamic. You know, like maybe you do really see what all of the buzz was about him before – Everything went sideways with his high school career, and he sat out his senior season and stuff, and a bunch of services dinged him for that. Um, Jaden Blue's an awesome player, man. I, I mean, I just uh, it's, getting a running back on the top ten list was a you know a little bit a little bit difficult for me, just simply because there's not one dude who's just like the the dude right now. It feels like Jaden Blue is kind of emerging to that point, though. Hey, catch, can I ask you a question? Um... You know, one of, one of the guys I, I like on the board is R. Long, 68. He, his comparison when he, when my columnist uh, on over the weekend, he, he compared um, Blue to Jamal Charles back in at, at UT. I only know Jamal, obviously, from his, his NFL days. Is that a fair comparison in your, in your, in your book? Or is that bridge too far? It's a bridge too far for me. Jamal Charles was essentially starting. And as a freshman at Ohio State, I mean, he was on a national championship team. He came in as a true freshman and was a dominant player in 2005 on a team that had Selvin Young and Ramont Taylor. Uh, they had a deep running back backfield. Jamal Charles was the best as a freshman. He was the best as a sophomore in a year that was a little bit of a struggle. In fact, one of the things that is really fascinating about Jamal Charles is at the end of the 2006 season, they played Iowa in the Alamo bowl and he didn't have a great Alamo bowl season. And after that year was over, Mac Brown made a point. I think it was at the signing day press conference that February of trashing Jamal Charles to the media off to the side, making a point to let people know that Jamal didn't go back in for a like they wanted him to go back in at one point he claimed he was hurt the coaches didn't think he was hurt there was a real like strange mm. relationship between the two i see the super chats we'll get to those in a second and then in 2007 he went nuclear kind of by accident colt mccoy gets hurt in the nebraska game they bring in john childs they they go to the zone read and the next thing you know jamal charles is like popping off 300 yard games he goes pro He's a hall of very good player in the NFL. He's not ever going to, I think, be a guy that ends up being in the Hall of Fame. But, you know, he was all pro, player of the year kind of stuff with the Chiefs. I get the Jaden Blue comparison because Blue is so explosive. But I, I personally, it's a bridge too far f- for me, even though I understand. I mean, Jaden Blue's going into a contract year, and, you know, he only got on the field last year because Jonathan Brooks got hurt. So I, I can't make that like side-by-side comparison. Although, you know, there are some similarities in terms of style. Uh, real quick, a couple of super chats, and then we'll move on after I ask you guys each a question. Uh, enough with these takes. We want to know, catch a stance on Klopp. Uh, Jurgen Klopp, Liverpool soccer manager, mm. has like six – Premier League games left before he goes into quasi retirement. I don't know why you want my stance on Klopp. We lost a game yesterday. We're running out of steam at the end of the year. Arsenal lost as well. If Liverpool just beats Crystal Palace at home, they're in first place right now in the conversation today. Looks a lot different. Instead, we had a pretty disgusting week. I'm not very happy. It feels like you guys are fucking with me, but you know, I guess I'm the I'm the donkey punching bag or whatever. But no, I'm not the happiest guy right now. I love Jurgen Klopp. I wish he was my dad. So there you go. Tom G says, "Good morning, fellas and OB fam. You're not going to troll me too, are you, Tom? Uh, Tom? Did we lock down our OB party location? Shout out to RT 
for doing the damn thing in the portal. Tom, yes. Tell you what, let me pull up the I got it. I got got it. it. Okay. I got it. I'm on it. This is it. We're going to be at the pitch on Friday. This Friday from 6 to 9, although you guys should know we'll be there a little earlier. We'll be there a little bit later. But officially from 6 to 9, a lot of the Orange Blood staff will be there. We'll do a QA. and a It should be a lot of fun. Guys, come out. Join us in Austin at the pitch. It's our pre-spring game mixer. And, Tom, we want to see you. We want to see uh, Money B. We want to see all you guys show up. So there – is the information we'll keep pumping it out all week long. Uh, thank you, Anwar, for having. I knew we had that thing created. Uh, thank you for putting that up. Um, by the way, if you guys have not been to the pitch and you're unfamiliar, it's, uh, about- it's halfway to Dallas. Okay. <laughs> so all right, just- all right. Well, let's, 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 it, it's not. <laughs> that being said, it's, it, it it's is, actually it, close it, to you, right? It's actually pretty close to you. From from a location standpoint, it's somewhere probably off of Palmer Road, 35-ish or so. But what I'm trying to say to encourage people to come is that it's actually a really badass place. They've got like tons of, of like food places that are out there. It's where Austin FC uh, holds their practices and, and everything, and that's where their facility is. They've got bars out there, restaurants. Sometimes they have live music that's playing there on Fridays, like – They've got like beach uh, uh, stuff out there. You want to play, bring the kids and have them play some beach soccer. They got some, they got some sand that's out there. My kids, we were just there last night. They had, we left there late, had a blast. So the pitch is at, if you've never been there, you will absolutely 100% enjoy it. So wait, is, is it by the place where they play the, the, the soccer games? No. Okay, so it's two different stadiums. It's it, but there's it's the Austin FC practice facility. A okay. couple of thoughts. One, I've never been there before, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, sounds like a badass venue, too. Alex, when we're trying to promote an event, oh. keep your negative thoughts inside. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm talking about just for me, for, inside from Spicewood. Got it. Got and because there could be people from Spicewood who yeah. might want to go and then they hear you and then they well, don't I'll, go. Well, I'll, I'll certainly do ah! that. Inside, either. lock it up inside, Got it. inside, negative thoughts inside. <laughs> uh, guys, real quick on the running back discussion. In a world where Jonathan Brooks doesn't get hurt last year, he wins the Doak Walker Award. Jaden Blue transfers because I think that probably would have happened. How would we be talking about Trey Wisner in – the context of the running, because I have not heard anybody mention C.J. Baxter's name all camp, not once, not in the scrimmages. Nobody's come up after a after a regular practice and said C.J. Baxter was the best goddamn player on the field today. Like that, that hasn't happened. It's been so much Trey Wisner discussion. Is he battling for the starting job if Jaden Blue's not around? It's hard because we know that's that's his boo, right? We know C.J. Baxter is Sark's boo. So, I, I, you know, I think he might be getting the same buzz that Blue is getting. I think C.J. is going to be C.J. Like, I, I don't – they're just – Sark, you know, that's Sark's guy. But I do think we'd be hearing a lot more Wisner takes for sure, Catch. I, I think you're on to something as, as relates to that. I was, I think that would show that maybe CJ Baxter is not that um I think that if, if everybody that comes in is going to be is going to be pushing CJ Baxter <laughs> obviously what does that say about CJ Baxter Then he needs to be having some more I think standout moments. Uh okay, I that, that, I will say this about Jaden Blue. I didn't have him in my February top 10 and as I looked back at my top 10 from February yesterday Jaden Blue was one of two players that I was like, oh, my God, this, yes, like has to be in my top 10 based on where I think he's headed, the buzz he's got this spring. Look back at what he did from a production standpoint a year ago, add all of those things together. I had him just outside the top 10 previously, but he he made the top 10 with room to spare uh, in the exercise that I did last night. Wide receivers. This one, 
could be all over the place. John Tate Cook, um, Ryan Wingo, Matthew Golden. I, I, I don't know completely what to make of the wide receivers in this type of discussion. Alex, I'll go to you first. Who do, who do you who do you consider at the wide receiver position for this type of discussion at this point in the spring? John T. Cook. And it's, for me, it's like I know there's been mixed reports about the guy. I've seen what I've seen of him. I, I know that there's been practices where he's had some issues with drops. I, I get it. Even uh, as recent as Saturday. Like yeah, it's but- pretty consistent that in camp, John T. Cook hasn't consistently caught the football. Right. Xavier Worthy didn't consistently catch the football, you know. No, he did, except for the time in his career when he played with a broken thumb. Like, statistically, when you look at Xavier Worthy's drop rate. What was it, like 8.9% last season, right? I mean, it's still not great. What's that? Wasn't it 8.9% last season? I I mean, it it still wasn't great. I'll look it up, but I'm I'm pretty sure it was nowhere near that high. Let's just look it up. Receiving. Well, don't get caught in the minutia. I'll look it up. You tell me about, is John Tay the only guy? Yeah, he's the only guy I, I consider because he's the only, you know, besides Deion. I mean, for one, I think he just has a different um, a different um, feel about him. He feels sort of like an alpha to, to me compared to DeAndre Moore, and it feels like there's nobody else that is just feels, you know, whether he's struggled, whether or not that's been the case. Um Whenever I've seen him out there, he's looked great. He's he's looked like the alpha. He reminds me a lot of awesome receivers that I've scouted in the past. I think he's fast. You think he's got a great? I think he's got a great catch radius. He's got you know sticky hands from what I've seen. Um, as I, as I've said, I know, I know that there have been drops, but he's fast as can be. He moves extremely well. Great great twitch. So um, it, I mean, to me, he's looked like the alpha when he when he's out there. And it's like I, I could I consider John T. Cook the wide receiver one on this team. And his usage would his you know, Isaiah Bond is being pushed by Ryan Wingo. These guys are mixing in and out for one another, right? Matthew Golden gets in over there with with, with those guys. I just I, I don't hear about John T. Cook getting pulled out for these other players. So uh for me it's John T. I feel like he's the wide receiver one. Could I be wrong about that? Maybe. I don't think I am. And I think come fall camp, we're gonna see that you know John T is the wide receiver one. Catch when you when you bring up the question of the receivers, I, if we're talking spring, right, and not just talking overall talent and what we project, right, but we're just talking the spring. I think the two guys that you have to mention in the conversation are Ryan Wingo and Matthew Golden. Like we, if we're just talking about, and this is this is not a, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm having a separate conversation as it relates to John T. Cook. I'm just talking about spring. We from uh, nearly every practice report, including the one on Saturday, we've heard about Ryan Wingo standing out and doing something special. Sark, unsolicited on two occasions, talked about how good Ryan Wingo has played and how it went and how good he has looked. So I'm just saying, if we have a top 10 conversation about performers in spring, you, you got to put Ryan Wingo in the conversation, right? I know. And then I think Matthew Golden's another person. We heard about him on Saturday. Um, he's probably somewhere in your number three-ish range. Like we can't get them all in, right? But Matthew Golden's a person that we've heard. Like who's got the strongest connection with Quinn? Matthew Golden. We heard Matthew Golden's name again this past weekend. So for me, it's, and when you ask the question, like is it just a John T. Cook thing? I think there's more. I think there's more people we can discuss. And I think – and we have just doing based on spring, I think we can have a really strong Ryan Wingo conversation to go along with it. Real quick, I did look it up on Cockamamie Pro Football Focus. Six six point three. So middle of the pack as far as college football. No, in college football, six point three. It's me. Yeah. It's, it's, I would say it was four point six as a freshman. And that if you looked at the wide receivers in the Big 12 with the most volume, six point three is pretty good. Just in terms of volume, receivers tend to have it seven, eight, nine, tens too high, which is where Xavier was in 2022 when he had all those drops at the end of the season. I think John Tate Cook is the best receiver on the team, but I don't, I, the receivers were, I, I'm like you, Anwar. I had a group of three, and I tried to ask myself, 
if we were going into a game tomorrow. And I had Isaiah Bond in there as well. I, I think it when you look at what he did at Alabama a year ago, it's hard not to at least include him in the conversation, even if this spring hasn't been as good as he had like. And I considered I had at one point Silas Bolden in my as my number 10 guy, even though he hasn't been here this spring. We're still talking about, about I won't let people forget. He led Oregon State in receiving, receiving yards, touchdowns, performed incredibly well against ranked teams a year ago at times, was the best player on the field against ranked teams. I think back to the Utah game where he had almost 160 yards of offense, a couple of touchdowns, receiving, running, return game. Like I think he's really, really good, and I don't think anybody's done anything this spring that should scare Silas Bolden when he arrives in the summer, but a lot of guys worthy of consideration. I don't know that any of those guys that were automatically in my top 10, no doubt about it. Although John Tate cook because of his overall talents, probably there. What about the Wingo conversation though? I considered Wingo as well that okay. he'd be for me, probably 11 through 15. Like I don't want to give away my list, but I think he's close. I mean, we know how talented he is. He's like this year's Malik Muhammad in that we're hearing about him as a freshman. And it's like, oh, okay, well, maybe he won't start. But that guy was a super blue chip. And the early reports are that he's every bit what a super blue chip should probably look like. Tight end. Anybody thinking Gunner Helm at all? I probably should. I mean, I, I yeah, I mean, you, you I think it would it would be wrong to not consider him i don't think it would be wrong to leave him off your top 10 right I, but, he, sure. but it's okay to like nominate him for the process oh yeah i mean he's gonna be the starting tight end I, i'm be man the one thing i'm it, super interested to see in the spring game is if amari nyblack finally gets you know if it's like i i want to see gunner helm and amari nyblack out there at the same time because you know that's how it's going to be in the fall this whole juan davis thing's been nice but like i i'd, I'd like to see I like to see those two guys. It feels like it's an it's an inevitability at this point, and um, uh, you know I'll be interested this week. I think that this week in practice, catch what we're going to get is we're going to if it's been if it's anything like the last few years. So there was a scrimmage on Saturday, right? This week they'll probably have practice Tuesday and Thursday. They'll have them be, they'll 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 have them in in, D, in DKR getting ready for the spring game, and we're probably it's going to be. They're going to be getting ready for the spring game, right? They're going to be going through. They're going to be installing stuff, all the rest of it. So I'm, I'm not sure we're going to get much stuff about oh, so and so looked good today. Or see, uh, we're almost but, beyond the point of needing to update so and so had a good practice. Oh, I mean, the, 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 we're not going to get that that info this week. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's just because just because it's I you know it's going to be more what kind of walkthrough kind of stuff they're going to be getting ready for the for the game, um, or getting ready for the scrimmage. But I, I mean, it'd be interesting to just keep our ears to the ground and just see is Amari not because this would be the week that like Amari Nyblack would start at least like walking through stuff with the ones, right? It, I mean, he missed all of he missed all of winter conditioning, and it feels like there's been a little bit more and more of a drum beat that because dude, it started out that first day of practice on War. Re remember, he was running behind like not just the Spencer Shannons and the Will Randalls of the world, but like. They're like the walk-ons would go, and then you see this big, hulking, awesome dude, Amari Nye Black, walk up and run his route. You'd be like, "Golly, you know, he should be the first one running these routes." And through the course of camp, we saw that he, you know, was working his way up to where he was getting in with the second group and starting to do some of this stuff. I think this would be the week that if we, if we saw him sort of walk. If he started out, if Nye Black started out this camp as working with the ones and we got to see him develop a connection and doing some of the stuff, you know, some of the flashes that we've seen from him working with the backups and he's doing that stuff with Quinn Ewers, right. Al alongside the first group. I think it would be, it would be harder to keep him off the list than it would be Gunnar Helm. So, and, and so I, I think if we were going to, if we were going to do this thing again in fall and maybe we will, I would, I would be very surprised if Amari Nyblack isn't on this list for, for, That's for I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to overlook Juan Davis though. 
I mean, it's, I, I, there's just too many people saying that he's he's looked well and played well the, in the spring. And, and look, it it it's out. I know, I know the nine black thing is what he did last year, and I know Juan Davis really hasn't put it together consistently. But there's too many people saying he is. And there's too, again, as we stand here in spring, right? I'm I'm just as we stand here on, on April 15th. Juan Davis is is outperformed. You know, nine black. And can he continue that? Can he keep that that pace up? We shall see. Um, but you know, he's, he, you know, the thing when, when Sark, here's the thing, when Sark mentions, I think you would agree with this. When Sark mentions a guy, I think there's, there's intentionality that's usually to it. Now, when Sark starts talking about injuries, I don't know, who knows, there may be a shell game as relates to injuries. Right. But when he starts praising a guy, he doesn't really praise the guy because he thinks there's too, there's not a lot of mind games going on. Usually when he praises a guy, there's, there's a reason for it. I think I, I got to pay attention to the Juan Davis praise. I think it's interesting that Gunnar Helm is never a highlight guy. Although I guess in the scrimmage two Saturdays ago, he he and Nye like both had highlight plays on the offense yeah. when there were plays. But he's very steady, Eddie. Like you know, you're constantly hearing, "Oh yeah, you know who's a good player, Gunnar Helm." But there's never like he's. So I considered him, but honestly, it, he didn't close. It wasn't – I probably considered Ryan Wingo more than I considered Gunnar Helm. Once it got to be brass tacks, put him in order. This one's interesting. Offensive line, look, Kelvin Banks is on the list. He's on everybody's list. Um, he should be high on everybody's list. He's the most proven player in the program at a high level at this point consistently. But the rest of this conversation is really interesting to me because I know Anwar mentioned Jake Majors earlier today on Orange Bloods and in, in, in my 10 Thoughts from the Weekend thread. Jake Majors has to certainly get some consideration. Alex, the offensive line is kind of your baby. Would you put Cam Williams and or Trevor Goosby in some top 10 consideration? No, I, I mean, I, I, I can't. Because I have to put DJ Campbell in, and I and I have to put Kelvin Banks in, and so uh, it's it, when they get there, you, you get right down to the rest of the other guys. I just I think that Cam Williams, we've heard everything that we we've heard everything that we wanted to hear this this fall, right? What do we want to hear out of Cam Williams? You look at my grades on Cam Williams from last year, right? And you look at what it, he shows up in the deep dig with his snaps per disruption. You're like, well. The snaps per disruption actually historically haven't been that bad compared to some of these dudes Texas has had in the past. He, he's a snaps per disruption guy about like, t- say, like Zach Shackelford, right? That's a dude that started for, well, like we've no, had, just, but it's don't, like, don't, don't mind me. But it's a dude who, it's a dude who, um, you, a dude who we rel- we kind of thought before was like, hey, he's, he's pretty, pretty dependable, you know what I mean? But sure. looking back, it was, a, it was a different era of offensive line play at, at, at Texas, right? But you see the grades, like the, that just don't take into account just the bonehead plays, right? Because Cam Williams would make a bonehead play, then he'd dominate for like three plays in a row, right? And you'd see the grades, you're like, well, how are his grades so high whenever he has a, this pretty high snaps per disruption and or penal, penalty cause? It was, it was penalties with, with Cam, too, whenever he was in there for the two games he qualified to be graded last year. And the reason why is because he grades so highly and plays so well on plays when he just doesn't have a boneheaded screw up. And the one thing that we heard from Sarkeesian, or the one thing, maybe it was from sources in the war room. I forgot what it was. Anwar, was this from your sources that said, man, he's just, it was like the one perfect thing that I wanted to hear. It's like, he's, he's, he, he, he's not making those screw ups anymore. He's, he's, he's not making these blow up plays. And to yeah. me, if Cam Williams is not making those blow up plays, he's going to be awesome because that was the only thing that was wrong with what he was doing, you know. So it's, it for, it'd be hard for me not to get Cam Williams on there. We've talked about Jake Majors a ton. Jake Majors at this point is actually good. You don't have to qualify it by saying anything. He'd be better if he got his strength up. He'd be, but yes, you know, all, anybody would be. But right now, Jake Majors is a, is actually good, and he's the communicator of that offensive line. They call him the football cyborg. You know, and he's actually a good a good player. Is he strong enough? He's plenty. He's plenty strong. So um, you can make a case for him. But those we, I think I I think you have to make a case for the proven dudes, specifically Banks and Campbell. Campbell that scored better than anybody last year as far as the deep dig grades, um, as far as the highest grade of the season. But um, yeah, I I think that 
majors would be the one after Campbell I would have to choose just because it's, even as confident as I am in Cam Williams, you're still a little bit betting on the con. Yeah, I think catch just if we if we if we're judging it catch on where they were last year as to where they are this year, like that jump, I think you're 100 percent when you talked about a, a Cam Williams making the, the progression, a Gooseby making a progression as relates to where they were last year. They, they've made some tremendous strides, right? But like, but then there's that whole okay, then there's the overall, you know, where are they at this moment? And and of course, you know, you have some guys who probably maybe rank ahead of them, but you're not wrong for the conversation, you know, be just where they and we're just talking about personal improvements and who's made the most personal strides, right? And we did that side by side, you would definitely put those guys in a conversation. No, I it'd be to me, you can't have any of the if you're having any of the guys, majors, cam. I threw Trevor Gooseby in there in part because he gets mentioned by so many people. Um, but you ha- that means you'd have three offensive linemen in your top ten because you can't you can't not have Kelvin Banks and DJ Campbell. If you're adding a- another guy into that group, that means you got to have those two guys in. And who knows? You could, I, I, you know, I I wouldn't blink at somebody who would have three offensive linemen in the top ten. I don't know that's quite where I would go, but you can the conversation. For the first time in forever, maybe since 2006, <laughs> yeah. is viable in a way that, like, it's very viable. I I won't blink if when this thing's over with, Anwar says, my number 10 guy is Jake Majors, and number seven is DJ Campbell, and number one is, or two or three is. Uh, <laughs> hey, yeah. hey, get off um, my list. Get off oh, my list. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> let's do this. Does anybody have a defensive tackle? That they feel confident in this discussion, top ten. Because I think we might be able to just move past that one pretty quickly. I sure don't. Yeah. Yeah. No D tackles. No nose tackles. Is yeah. another conversation. Yeah. I'm I mean no nose tack. I mean no interior defensive linemen. No, exactly. No, no interior defensive linemen, but defensive ends and edges. I think there's a number of guys that can be discussed in this kind of breath. Yeah, I mean, I I think look, you guys will have your own list. I I couldn't make a list that didn't look. You 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 have to consider Ethan Burke. You have to consider Trey Moore, just based on the fact that he's the you know he, he could he could be a real linchpin here, and you know the fact that he's being used not only as a defensive end but also as a Sam linebacker. They're they're gonna have all kinds of edge rush stuff for him. He's been good. He's looked good. He's looked a little you know. On the first day of practice, I was a little bit, um, uh, you know, not disappointed, just a little bit surprised that he looked a little smaller than I thought. But as we got to, as you got to kind of see him, you got to see him move, you got to see how his body worked. Um, I, I he look, he's 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 fine. He he doesn't look, he doesn't look that small. I had an overinflated picture of his size and his and his length in my mind, but look, that was not important. Like after I've seen him. Um, he looks fine. He's got plenty of band. He's got good enough length, really, really good burst off the football, really good closing ability. And just they're, they're abusing him all over the place and he's working in with the ones and he's, you know, he's going to be a big part of stuff. Um, and then of course, Baron Sorrell, who, you know, just quietly just going along and, you know, had tons of pressures last year. Didn't quite get home as much as everybody would have hoped. And I think this year, man, even though he might play less, it could be helpful. It could be helpful that there's all these dudes, these edge dudes, these defensive ends and stuff like that, where the staff can really hone in and say, okay, well, in this kind of spot, this is where Sorrell can thrive. So like, let's make sure and get him in. Or this is the kind of spot where, hey, man, we got to we gotta go to the Lamborghini package. We got to put Colin Simmons on one side and, you know, uh, Zena or, you know, Trey Moore on the other side or stuff like that. Or like, you know, this is the kind of thing where, you know, we want it to be Burke and Sorrell and stuff. There's, there's going to be a, a million things that they can do in the way that they dial it up. I think even if it results in less snaps for a guy like Sorrell, which, which he needs, you know, he, he needs less snaps. And that's no shade to him. It's just like he shouldn't be playing the fourth most snaps on defense of, of, of anybody. I don't think any guy, edge rusher, defensive line, anybody that's a kind of a front four guy should, should be playing that, that many snaps. In the end, it's probably de- detrimental to them. 
it could be helpful. And so I think Sorrell is a guy that you, you certainly have to consider. Those are the first three that came to mind for me, though. Burke, Moore, and Sorrell, even though there are lots of other – I mean, you guys know how much I love Colin Simmons and all the – I, I kind of think Simmons is going to be a little bit more on the – you know, like we've talked about, like on the Anthony Hill package, right? Like on the Anthony Hill sort of timeline. Same sort of caliber of prospect. Sort of the same – feeling through spring he's not starting you know and then like you get to fall camp he's still not starting but he's starting to kind of mix in and by the you know by the third fourth game there's some kind of package where it's some Colin Simmons and like you really get that dude rolling by the end of the season but I'm not sure at this point we can put Colin Simmons in there I would think that if we redid this exercise at the end of next season looking forward to spring football we, we probably would need to include Colin Simmons Catch, I'll just tell you real quick. Just without, I, I'll reveal a portion of my list, not make it easy. It was, I, Sorrell was the only guy I, could, I considered and put on my uh, my list. I didn't consider anybody else from the uh, from that that the defensive line or the edge position. It was in not not in my top ten. Interesting. When we get to really the- okay, because okay. no. I have no. I have all three in my top ten. <laughs> wow. We'll wow. see. Yeah, we'll see. Wow. Man. We'll, so when wow. we get to the actual top That'd ten. That'd be interesting. Yeah. Um, the thing is, I think, and shame on me, I forgot to include DJ Campbell in my original top ten, and I'm amending that. He's clearly, for me, a top ten player. There gets to be, like, though, once you hit, like, six or seven yeah, it gets on tough, your top man. ten list. There's it's like you get arch in there. Yeah, you can't get arch last in there. three, yeah. and I don't know that any of them have earned it. Um, it's so we'll get there. Linebacker, this one's easy, right? There's Anthony Hill, and there's nobody else, right? We're not ready to put David Benda in that kind of conversation or Mo Blackwell. To me, it's Anthony Hill, and everybody else is still trying to to get to that kind of level. Any disagreement there? Oh no. No, I mean, I, mean I, 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 I can't speak for on war, but hey, catch when we reveal our top 10, by the way, should we just go ahead and put this in the system so we can put it on the screen like 10 through one through no, 10? And 10 through we nine, probably or... should have, but that sounds like a lot I got time to do it now, but while we while you guys are talking, we can do it while other people are talking. I I can add mine in too. Okay, we're we'll gonna do 10, 10 through one, sure. Okay, uh, and then real quick before we get to our top tens, the last position is defensive backs. Um, this was one that for me, and I'll, I'll spoiler alert at the end of camp. I think Malik Muhammad is one of the five best players in, on the team right now. I think that he's had a great camp. I think there was a point in camp where Anwar, you know, he was, uh, he's fasting and his body was going through some things where, you know, he struggled with a little hammy here and they were being held out, but it feels like in these last two camp, last two weeks, he has elevated his play. He had an interception on Saturday. Uh, a lot of people were talking about him on Saturday, but it feels like of all of the DBs on the team that Malik Muhammad is the guy that if you were to ask these coaches, who's the first guy on the field when they pencil in a starting lineup, I think it would be him. Even on Saturday, Terrence Brooks and Gavin Holmes were going back and forth with the ones. You know, we know there's battles at safety. Um, so for me, Malik Muhammad, along with Jaden Blue, is one of those guys that I didn't have in the top 10 in February that I quickly put on my list um, yeah. for the here and the now. For me, it's almost a discussion of the other defensive backs who we feel comfortable slotting into that type of discussion. Yeah. And, you know, there, and there's, there's a lot of those guys who are there, like once you get past the moments of the world. And I mean, you have to have like a John A. Barron kind of conversation. Like where does he fit in? Um, you know, with, within that, there's a Gilbo conversation where, you know, Sark is proclaiming this guy's back. And my sources are saying, like, he looks like the guy that beat out John A a couple of years ago. So, you know, there, there are that from that, that DB room. And that's even before we get to, you know, the safety position, uh, where there's the Makubas of the world, the Derek Williams of the world. So, you know, it becomes a little bit tighter once we get into that secondary, um, 
But, you know, it's an interesting conversation. The other part of it, too, Catch, is there's probably only, with that second narrative, there's probably only a couple of guys you stand on the table for. And it's hard to stand on the table too too strongly when you realize how bad the pass defense was last season. Um, and we can't just put it all on Keaton Crawford because he's not here. Like, there's some other things that were involved. So, um, but you're right, M- Muhammad has been the guy that, and it's been impressive for him to even go through Ramadan and still be as good and effective as he was overcoming uh, what we, what I was told was a hamstring injury a little bit earlier. Like being able to do that is, has been incredibly uh, impressive. Was he fasting? Yes. What's the rules with that? You guys, you can only, you can't eat until nighttime. Yes. Yeah, sun up and sundown. You cannot eat. I remember that was a big deal for uh, graf- graffiti gear, gear and what, what it, who was the oh who was that wick wick line he had some he had some choice words about some choice words about no it's, it's not a yeah it's a an ex, you know it's one of those things that when guys are committed to it they put themselves through the physical ringer to a bit and it was happening with Muhammad mm-hmm. uh, and I'm sure the coaches were frustrated right they they want their football players to be able to to be football players 100%, but that he's come out through the fire on this, and I think an even better position. Um, I think he's proven his value this spring. I think he's one of the best players on the team right now, uh, regardless of position. I think he is day in and day out, from what I've been hearing, really, really impressive. So now that takes us to our top tens. And before we give the top tens, I do want to give – a special shout out to the show sponsor, uh, our guys over at Rogue Shop. Uh, I, I can't believe I forgot to mention them at the top of the show. I just brain dead. Uh, look, man, they've got their 420 Rogue Shop sample pack right now where you can get gummies and uh, the new THCA flower uh, ice cream paint job. They got a little bit of everything in there. You can get sour green apples and black lemonades and there's a little they got a little bit of everything go to the website check it out if you're in pain the topicals are fantastic the oils the delta 8 products the vapes the vape carts which i'm a big fan of i literally have it right here in front of me uh they've got vitamins and supplements they got a little bit of everything for you go check it out like find out what your thing is i saw people talking about on orange bloods this weekend whether or not people had used uh, the CBD, the salve for pain treatment and almost two dozen people chiming in like, yeah, that stuff helps a lot. My uncle's 85 years old was always kind of anti CBD products, you know, anti marijuana, anti THC, all that stuff. One week of the salve at like in his eighties, and he was like, oh, I was stupid my entire life. Let me get the hookup now until I'm no longer here. So uh, it, seeing is believing. Go to the website, rogueshop.com. Check it out. Uh, seeing is believing, using is believing. Um, and why wouldn't you make your life a little bit better when you can? Okay, time to go to our top tens. Anybody want to go first? How do we get that? We gotta take I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay, there we go. Anybody want to go first? I'll, I mean, I'll I'll go if y'all if you if, if if you want. Let's see it, Alex. Alex right. is top ten. All right, here 10. we go. So number ten, Baron Sorrell. Number nine, Jonte Cook. Number eight, Trey Moore. Number six, Ethan Burke. Number six, Manny Muhammad. Number five, DJ Campbell. Number four, Derek Williams. Number three, Anthony Hill. Number two, Quinn Ewers. Number one, Kelvin Banks. Thanks. I mean, it's pretty. I feel like it's pretty chalky. Um, Alex. You want a thought on that? Yeah. We have nine of the 10 same players. So I don't know if it's chalky or if our brains are in the same place. Um, The difference is I didn't have Derek Williams in my top 10. I probably would have him 11 through 15. I didn't quite have Derek Williams that high. Maybe because I had Malik Muhammad as a number one DB right now. Uh, But I like your list. I think that – I could quibble with a few things, but it would only be very slight quibbling. I was my my biggest uh, the way I put it together. My biggest concern was whether to put Quinn over Kelvin Banks. So I'll be interested to see what you guys did with that. If anybody has Quinn at number one, but 
Yeah. Anwar, you want me to go next? Well, yeah, you go next right? because I think mine is going to be different than the both of yours. Okay. Well, here's my top 10. Number 10, John Tay Cook. Number nine, Ethan Burke. Number eight, Trey Moore. Number seven, Baron Sorrell. You can see I just jammed the edges and the, and the ends all in one pile there. Uh, I think you could make a case in the order, in any order that you want to, but uh, Anwar has done so much positive reporting on Baron Sorrell in camp that even though Ethan Burke had more sacks than he did a year ago, even though Trey Moore arrives with 14 sacks on the ledger, it was hard to ignore that Baron Sorrell is a constant buzzword. Uh, number six, DJ Campbell. Number five, Jaden Blue. Number four, uh, Manny Muhammad. Number three, Anthony Hill. Number two, Quinn Ewers. Number one, Kelvin Banks. And Alex, just to answer your question, I don't think I don't think a person can. I mean, I guess they could, but Kelvin Banks is the m- most certifiable player on the roster. He's the guy that has been a legitimate first team All Big Twelve All America candidate from the players that are returning. Quinn Ewers was just a very good quarterback a year ago. And he hasn't been dominant. He's been very good, very solid. But to me, I mean, Quinn Ewers hasn't been the buzzword coming out of the last two scrimmages. It hasn't been, oh my God, Quinn Ewers just, he looks like the best thing since sliced bread. People have been complimentary of him but in not such a way that I think you could justify putting him ahead of Kelvin Banks. So our so, lists are very so close, yeah, Alex. Yeah, so the only difference is, is like right at the very top in that four, because I had Derek Williams at four, you have Jaden Blue at five, and I did not have Jaden Blue in mind at all. That's the difference. You I think Jaden Blue is going to have a monster season, and I think he's going to go off to the NFL – after this season is well, over. If that's, the case, if that's the case, then my list will have been bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? But well, it, no, it just yeah. means, you know, I mean, I would imagine Jaden Blue is somewhere close. That Oh, yeah, you know, from, yeah, yeah. Well, it's just from, to me, it's like I, I try putting a running back on there because I'm like, well, who's the starter? Like, I think I think it just takes a little bit of projection, right? But could yeah. I could I, could I I see him getting there? Of, of, of course. It's not like I'm not – I, I, I did put – part of Blue's deal is – he led the team in yards per carry, although very slightly, only by a fraction of a percentage point over Jonathan Brooks. But he's still, in, with 65 carries last season, led the team in yards per carry. So I think there's a production side that although it didn't come into the last four games of the season, I think spotlighted Blue really well. Uh, 11 through 15 for me, Derek Williams might be 11. And then... 12 through 15 might all be wide receivers just because I feel like they're all really talented. Like I'm shocked for me that Isaiah bond isn't in the top 10 at this point, considering what he did at Alabama a year ago. Uh, Ryan Wingo Silas Bolden might legitimately, even though he's not on campus yet deserve to be on this list. So I've got just a bunch Matthew golden. I've got a, a cluster of wide receivers outside the top 10. Uh, But again, I think for me, there were like a half dozen guys I'm trying to think of in that last spot. I gave the benefit of the doubt to John T. Cook, who (laughs) hasn't had the best spring, but I'm projecting still to have a pretty monster uh, sophomore season. Worry about right. more. Well, this here I'll go. Good. And this is this is gonna be different. And I, I I'm I well, there you know, which is these kids is doing his own thing. Tell me, can you guess this one catch? Well, here we go. Uh for me, number 10 was DJ Campbell, number nine, I put Cook, eight, I put Sorrell, seven, I put Jake Majors, six, I put Jaden Blue, five is Derek Williams, four, Manny Muhammad, three, Anthony Hill. Uh, two with Quinn Ewers, and one Kelvin Banks. So I put three offensive linemen in my top 10, DJ Campbell, Jake Majors, and Kelvin Banks. That seemed to be kind of a little bit of a difference. I was, you know, and I feel like Derek Williams, I put in there. I don't think that was – he was on your list, Catch, if I remember seeing correctly. 
Um, but I put Derek Williams in my top five, actually. And I put Jaden Blue at, at number six. So that's my, my thing. And as you saw, for me, it was Sorrell. And that was the only edge guy I was willing to consider uh, on my list. So a little bit different than you guys. I went a little bit heavier on the Jake Majors thing. I'm probably a little bit more sold on him uh, maybe than you guys are. But this, uh, I feel like what he's been able to do and accomplish – uh, not only not only throughout his career, kept, I mean, you know, Alex says he's he's good. Uh, I'm not saying great, but for where he is on this team, I can put him as a, a really important piece. So those are the, that's how I kind of came to my conclusion of the top ten. I don't really have much of an issue. I mean, most of you know, I had Derek Williams eleven. Maybe I'm wrong for having him so far down the list. I don't think I could. I have a hard time making a case that majors should be ahead of Campbell uh, based on last year's performance. But I think we're, we're talking about very fine margins here. Like, I don't think for you seven is a Canyon ahead of 10. No. Um, what's interesting is we all have Campbell cook, Sorrell, Muhammad, Hill, Ewers, and Banks. We, we agree on seven of the ten. The the ones you two, both of you had Derek Williams, and I didn't. Onwar and I both have Jaden Blue, and Alex doesn't. Onwar has Jake Majors, and we didn't. But I don't have a problem with that. And then I guess that's really it, right? Because the rest of us all, in some shape, form, or fashion have the other seven players on the list. We both had Ethan Burke and Trey Moore and all. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. I forgot about that. So there's a clear seven. And then it seems like there's another five that there's a semi consensus with. Uh, and if we were doing like a, a like a composite, uh, actually, you know what? I may do a composite of our top tens and post that. On the website, we all agree that Kelvin Banks is one. Yeah. We all agree that Quinn Ewers is two, and we all had Anthony Hill as three, which I think, you know, doesn't get more consensus than everybody agreeing on one, two, three. Um, I enjoyed the process. I'm. Yeah. I, I enjoyed the, seeing catch, the the one guy I still. If I if I have any like the thing I don't like about my list. If I just based it on the spring, I feel like I should have probably put Wingo in my top 10. Is there anybody, Alex, you would stand on the table for? Now that we've seen our lists, is anybody being mistreated and undervalued? Uh, well, I mean, it's just like not to not to say anything about your list, but I think if for the consensus list had Derek Williams being brought down because he was at 11 on yours, I think I'd be like, man. I think Derek Williams should be top five. <laughs> like it's just, and I just, I just, I think that that would, um, you know, has that, Derek Williams had that kind of camp? I mean, we've heard it, but we've, I mean, I've seen him. Because he didn't have that kind about, of a season. Well, I mean, he 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 was. I, by the end of the season, they consider him the, their best cover safety. Now, do you? I mean, what, do you, what does that really mean on the you know, defense that was as bad as Texas was last yeah, year? Yeah, that's like right? saying that I'm the best. Five foot ten, overweight basketball player on my street corner. Like <laughs> they, were, they were running their safeties out of hey, town. Dude, and maybe you're yeah. like the voice. Maybe you're the you're the um, you're the unbiased one that just don't you know that hasn't um, hasn't been out there as, as much to the you know to the various media practices and stuff like that where you just gotten to see him. And but it, it, it's not just been this. It's just been all that. I think that Derek Williams, maybe when you're around him and you watch him practice, can maybe spellbind you a little bit. Maybe, okay. you know, maybe make you think it's like, golly, look, he just look. Do you at know him. who I was going to stand on the table for a little bit and just give a little bit of love? Michael Taft. Because that dude gets love from every practice somebody mentions Michael Taft. Yeah. And, and we didn't I mention him. That's, I'm only mentioning him now. Because nobody mentioned him, and that maybe he deserved a mini mention. So if we did like an all snub team, 
like we would put tap, you know, because you know when they do like the yeah. Pro Bowl collections, yeah. and it's always like who got snubbed, right? Like you who didn't tap. get their combine invites? Yeah, you know, so JD tap. in the chat is saying that y'all disrespected Jade, but it's nothing new around here. I mean, I maybe maybe it is a little bit. Maybe Jade b- belongs. He was a know, pretty average player a year ago, and he hasn't had a big spring. Yeah, I was, I'm kind of just – when I was thinking about it, I was kind of thinking like the best players on the team coming out of spring, but also the guys that have created buzz during spring and stuff. I wanted to make it a little bit more spring football related, and Ketchum's right. It doesn't feel like – it feels like we've heard a lot more about his backup. Been a lot more – Gilbo's a guy that probably is on the all-snub team because – he was working now. I know Baron. I don't even think I don't know if he scrimmaged on Saturday, but I know that Gilbo played a lot with the ones. And we know that this follows on the hills of a lot of people mentioning Gilbo, Sark mentioning Gilbo multiple times. I think John A. Baron would be in my 11th or 15 if I really, really crunched it down. But he didn't, if he'd had a big year ago, a big year a year ago, he'd be in the draft right now. He came back for another year because he was kind of okay. He was he was solid, but he wasn't anything more than solid a year ago. And I don't think he's had a buzzy camp. It's not like oh, when camp started, it was like oh my god, is Gilbo going to go to the outside? Or are we going to see Gil? We're going to see Jade Bear and make the move to the outside and challenge Terrence Brooks. And that hasn't really happened. And there has been more talk about his backup. Than there has been of him. That doesn't mean that he's that Gilbo's a better player. It just means that there's been more buzz on the backup than the starter. Yeah, and the thing I would say as a guy who, who you know had to vote for the Hall of Fame stuff for a living, and you know, it's always like the subjective step. I, I would always respond back respectfully, JD. Right? Is you got to say who do you take off of a list to put on the list? Right? So it's easy to say like that guy shouldn't. That guy deserves to be on the list. You got to say, who do you take off, right? They, the guys who make it in the Hall of Fame, that list sucks. Okay, well, who do you take off to put your guy in? That's where you got to say, okay, who do you take it off? Who would you put in? All right, guys, let's wrap this up because I got a manager's meeting I got to attend to. Um, I like the process. Our top tens, I think, were informative. I think you put that stuff together and it makes a very interesting list. For the guys over at Rogue Shop, uh, thanks to everybody at Specs, the Specs chat. As a matter of fact, let's just uh, let Lisa tell you about Specs real quickly before we sign off. I don't know what's going on today, but Mike, let's just knock this out. You're needing Specs same day delivery can save the day with our Specs app or online shopping. From world class wines to hard to find spirits and craft beers to gourmet foods, delicious snacks, and spectacular sweets. It's Specs. Cheers to savings. Thank you, Lisa, and the people over at Specs, for myself, for Alex, for Anwar. Guys, hit that thumbs up button. Do it right now while we're talking to you about it. Subscribe to the channel. Get notifications. We'll have we'll have house divided in a couple of hours. The recruiting hour later on this afternoon. Um, the old fashioned. We'll be back tomorrow morning. And oh, by the way, yes, on Friday, don't forget our spring game mixer. A lot of us from the Orange Blood staff will be there, including me. I'm making the trip. From the Woodlands this Friday, I think, April 19th. I think Cody Carpentier is coming in, isn't he? He's yes! coming in all the way from Virginia or something. Both Cody's are coming in. So, like I said, pretty much the entire Orange Bloods crew will be there. Join us. It'll be a lot of fun. Like I said, for myself, for Anwar, for Alex, for all of you who that participated, thank you. We'll see you soon.